Well, you, you probably know what Gandhi said, right? Gandhi said that his favorite group of people to work with in nonviolent movements was former soldiers. And he said because they've already faced death and because they have the courage to act in ways that will make nonviolence effective. So it's really an honor for me uh, to be here uh, with you. And I think we're here because we, we want to honor veterans, but we're also here to express our determination to build a world of peace, an economy that actually works for all of us, and an economy that is actually sustainable, as Jason was, was alluding to. We gather in a nation that is both the most unequal of all the industrial countries and is the most militarized country in the history of the world. That's the rather sobering reality under which we gather. And you kind of wonder, how did that happen? And I think Ike Eisenhower got it right when he warned the country in his last speech to the country about the military industrial complex. And what he said to the country was the danger of the military industrial complex is that now military spending was disconnected from defense or security. Now military spending was disconnected from the real security needs of the country and the power of the military industrial complex. It threatened to undermine and erode the very fabric of our democracy. The first casualty of war, people say, is truth. And every war is a lie because wars promise that they will somehow bring peace and they don't bring peace. They tend to bring more violence. They tend to bring lots of suffering. If, if truth is the first casualty, the second casualty is veterans, the people who we send to fight wars. And they sell us our wars by selling us fear. The fear of Iraq, now it's the fear of Iran, the fear of communism, the fear of terrorism. It's one fear after another. Hermann Goring, some of you know, the second in command in Nazi Germany, if you'll let me flip here, I want to get the quote right. He said, it was easy for the leaders to sell us on war. He said, quote, all you have to do is tell them they are being attacked and denounce the peacemakers for lack of patriotism and for exposing the country to danger. It works the same way in every country. That's what Goring said. Soldiers are the next casualty of war. Many soldiers who are here tonight, you carry in your bodies the physical wounds, you carry in your hearts the psychological wounds, you, in some ways, are sharing with civilians. You are common casualties of war. And you have embodied in your lives the consequences of other people's lives. And I think, I hope, that all of us are here because we are willing to say, we will not listen to those lies anymore. One, one of the most painful lessons to learn in the most militarized country in the history of the world is that patriotism and nationalism are not friends of soldiers. They are scoundrels. The three most dangerous words a soldier in America can hear today, support our troops. Because what is really being said most of the time is support unjust wars, support criminal presidents, support war profiteers. Dissent is treason. Those are dangerous words. The most militarized country in the world is undergirded by two myths. The first is the belief in American exceptionalism that we are morally superior, and that gives us the right to dominate the world, to project power everywhere, to have a thousand military bases outside of our borders, to invade and occupy other countries at will. We even
even claim that somehow we are the servants of God when we embrace militarism and war. And another reason that we are here is that we will not ever, ever go along with those lies again. The second myth, foundational myth that allows us, allows us as a people to give in to the logic of war is that a belief system in this country is now the usefulness of violence. You have a problem, then superior violence saves. You have a problem, then superior military power will solve that problem. Well, we all know, all of us here know, there are no military solutions to the problem of hunger and poverty. There are no military solutions to the problem of climate change. There are no military solutions to the problem of inequality. There are no military solutions to the problem of war. But there are solutions, and that's also why we are here. Now, this may not sound like good news, but this, I think, is good news. Part of our context and part of what brings me here is that the signs are now abundantly clear that we are living in a nation in serious and rapid imperial decline. Yes! And I want to I want to cite five clear signs really really quickly. One and maybe most important that increased militarization is always used by empires when they are in crisis and it only serves to accelerate the pace of our internal economic and social decline. Yep. And the 99% we're now rising up and we are demanding an end to those war priorities so that we can heal the country, have a health care system that works for all of us, have an agricultural system that is regionalized and works for us and future generations, that cares about each other and makes the changes that we know need to be made. A second sign of an empire in crisis is that politics is overwhelmingly driven by fear. And now we are being told that we must fear Iran. We are told constantly that we must fear terrorists. Do you know that last year, 45,000 Americans died because they didn't have health care. Three Americans died worldwide because of acts of terror. And yet we live in a context in which our politicians are constantly selling war by selling fear. A third sign of imperial decline is that, it, is that now our military spending is driven exclusively by profits, the profitability of the military industrial complex, the profitability of those who benefit from war. It is not rooted in national defense. It is not rooted in authentic security. And everyone here, I believe, understands that it is right and proper for a nation to have defense. That is not an excuse for imperialism, for militarism, for stealing oil, for occupying other countries, for producing weapon systems that we do not need. And another major point I want to make tonight, and this is a hard one, and I hope I've nuanced it well enough, and you can tell me, those of you who are vets, whether I have. But a fourth sign of imperial decline is the superficial idealization and veneration of soldiers. Yeah. The superficial. Yeah. You can go to a Twins game and see, see flags 100 yards deep covering the whole field. You will go and you will see planes flying over. You will go and you will hear soldiers throwing out the first pitch or see them doing that. But you will not be listened to. You will not be respected. You will not have your health care needs met. You your it. employment needs don't matter. Yes. That false idealization is at the heart of a culture of war, and we have to, we must, we can say thank you to soldiers without idealizing war and giving legitimacy to unjust oh, war. Yes. And finally, in terms of the signs of imperial decline, 
And this should be a concern to everyone here in the Occupy movements all over the country, which are movements of tremendous hope and tremendous poss possibility. And that sign of imperial decline is the criminalization of dissent. The criminalization of legitimate dissent. Jeffrey Sachs, a mainstream economist, was in town the other day, and he just said it crystal clear. He said, the people in the United States have no one representing them because the Republicans are owned by the oil industry and the Democrats are owned by Wall Street. The Occupy movement, he said, is exactly right. We know that we are here, and I know that I am part of Occupy because we have no listening partner. And we will have a listening partner when we build a social movement that is strong enough that it forces them to listen to us. And we will stay as long as it takes. The best way, the best way I know of honoring vets is to work for peace. The best way I know of honoring vets is to end the senseless wars. The best way to honor vets is to work to build a decent society a society in which we care about each other, a society in which we take the resources we're now squandering on war, and we use them to build schools, we use them to establish a single-payer health care system, we use them to meet the essential needs of all of our communities. When we do that, then we can legitimately talk about the authentic security of the country. Then we can talk about what it means to be part of a peaceful America. Thank you. Yeah.